We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, we're recording on a Tuesday morning. We're running a little late. we got to quit a little early. However, before we do all that, I, I have to congratulate myself. I deserve congratulations. Uh, we had you. We had a little uh, family get-together over the weekend there, and, uh-huh. uh, and my nephew was over, and I've been practicing Smash Brothers, and I legitimately, in a one-on-one battle where we were both honestly giving it our all and trying defeated my nephew in smash brothers uh all thanks to yoshi and that butt stomp of his there we uh, go I, how I old is your good. nephew uh, he's nephew? he's just about to turn 16 all right well that's old enough where he can take a defeat good all right i felt like you were crushing like an eight-year-old child <laughs> no 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 see i mean uh, turning 16 you're almost at the prime of your reflexes and all that so uh so i feel pretty accomplished there you know i'm closing yeah. in on 40 here so yeah I remember when that. Uh, I remember when that felt old. <laughs> it does to me, and, man. I still got a couple. As well. I still got a couple of years to go, but uh, you know, yeah. I'm closer to that than I am to 16. That's for darn sure. Yeah, and I want to correct uh, some uh, mischaracterizations from last week. I listened to the beginning of last week's podcast. Oh, okay. Rob was Rob was like. Well, this is all my fault and blah, blah, blah. Stop being so dang Canadian, dude. I went to the doctor <laughs> yeah. to have a... And I got in there and I had a 9.30 appointment. I got there at 9.29, all right? Yeah. Because you know they're not going to take you in before 9.30. Not That's usually. not yeah. happening. But we start recording at 10 o'clock. I thought, you know, I, it was basically a follow-up. So I was going to go okay. in, talk to the doctor. He was going to look at the lab reports and tell me I was fine, which is what he did. And then I was going to be out. Two hours yeah. later yeah. i left that place it was ridiculous there was people in there and i went in before people who had appointments before me mm-hmm. <laughs> i was like they were like i was i'm gonna schedule at 9 15 i was like oh crap why am i going in today i mean it was <laughs> it was nuts so no rob did not cause last week it was my doctor <laughs> well yeah stupid. I, stupid. I had an appointment i couldn't miss so yeah, that's there we go. that's how that all worked out that's it okay. Th- uh, thank you to Lee Overstreet for filling in yeah. last week. That's a big, big help, and we uh, we put out an episode. I always so know with, I don't always know when Lee fills in because he drops out, and then there's just you at the end of the podcast. There was. For it was only for one extra hour. question though, and it's a question that you know I, I didn't think you would be like super eager to weigh in on, and uh, so yeah, it, it all worked. We're all right. Yeah. Hello, welcome to AV Rent. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can find us at www.avrant.com for our website, uh, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. If you email us directly, rob at avrant.com. His Twitter's at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter's at avrant underscore Tom. Mm. I want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, you can support the podcast in some way. If you want to do that financially, you can go to www.avrant.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and leave us a PayPal donation. So we want to thank Chad, Neil, Chris, and Luke, who did that over the last two weeks. Yeah. they don't announce it if I don't tell them what it is. So <laughs> thank you, Chad. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Luke. I did promise we'd get names that came in last week, and there they are. So Chad, Neil, Chris, and Luke, thank you so much for those PayPal donations. We also want to thank our 82 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon is a service where you sign up for a monthly uh, donation that will be taken from your account and given to us. So thank you to our 82 patrons. Yeah, it's like a voluntary subscription. You can think of it that way. You can give us any amount. If you're super rich, give us all the money. We wouldn't mind. That's Patreon.com slash Podcast. And thanks so much to our 82 patrons over there. All right, and if you can't support us financially, figure out some other way to support us and let us know, and we'll thank you. So Mark told Accessories for Less that we are 100% the reason he's bought several items from them. He also wanted to share that Accessories for Less recently went above and beyond. Mark's been tracking down the last few Focal Little Bird speakers that are out there. One or two still pop up on uh, Accessories for Less's uh, website from time to time, and a single Little Bird in white showed up. He found another single Little Bird in white on eBay, so he ordered both. The eBay one shipped, but then Accessories for Less emailed him to say that the one their website was no longer available i think it was the same one <laughs> it might have been sometimes that happens like on sometimes you see it on amazon and somewhere else and if you order it on one it yeah. disappears from the other it's not impossible 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so, 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 and even though the order had initially gone through, so he talked to them and explained having ordered the, the one, for the the one from eBay that he couldn't cancel at this point, and the accessory for us was probably like, oh, that's ours. So, <laughs> to help him out, they tracked down a pair of birds, not little, but the regular birds, and sold them to him at the little bird's price. So now he's got one little bird yeah. and two birds. I'm sure three. he could sell that little bird to somebody. Yeah, put it up on eBay. Put it up on eBay. Buy it back right. for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that's good. I mean, uh, clearly they wanted to help him. <laughs> they, they they weren't like legally required to do that or anything. So that's yeah. that's good service. We got glad to hear about that. And thank you, Mark, for uh, for talking us up to them because uh, that's a good relationship we built there. Samsung has confirmed they won't be making any more Blu-ray players. Hmm. They don't have any new Blu-ray model, Blu-ray player models for 2019, and they're phasing out their existing players. Uh, some people notice that LG didn't announce any new players for 2019 either, but they haven't said they're exiting the disc player market altogether quite yet. Yeah. Panasonic and Samsung announced their full 2019 TV lineups. Panasonic is supporting HDR10+, and Dolby Vision on almost all their models. Samsung is bringing full array local dimming to the Q7 series. Yeah, so, so at least they changed their model numbers a little bit there over at Samsung now because before we had uh, in 2017 we had like a Q9F or a Q8F and then in 2018 it was a Q9FN or a Q8FN so the N was the only way you could tell between 2017 and 2019 or 2018 now in 2019 it's going to be like a Q90 or a Q80 or a Q70 so there's a zero after the number now it helps us tell what year the darn thing came out uh, yeah that's about it Samsung refuses to support Dolby Vision that's probably why they're not bothering with Ultra HD Blu-ray players anymore and they're gone and it's kind of weird because they were almost the only choice for HDR10 plus Ultra HD Blu-ray players we got Panasonic we so oddly enough have OPPO even though they're not selling players anymore but they put out a firmware <laughs> update to support HDR10 plus but Panasonic is kind of the only game in town now because Samsung was like the only ones doing HDR10 plus so if you're getting IMAX enhanced titles and want to hear that HDR uh, see that HDR10 plus video uh, I guess you're getting a Panasonic <laughs> I wonder if OPPO is just going to go into the OEM market if that's what they've done they've stopped mass marketing oh they're just they're just done with player they're just like yep cell phones that's it that's what we do now do they even sell those cell phones in America? I, I don't, don't think they do. I haven't seen them much. I think there was, I yeah, like one them. or two models in North America, but it's mostly in European and Asian markets, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd buy the Oppo. I could at least consider an Oppo <laughs> phone. phone. Yeah. I mean, if they have the same uh, dedication to features that they have for their players, mm. I'd be interested in at least taking a look at it. All right. Uh, other news, I guess, is that what we're doing now? Yeah, some yeah. comments. No, here. comments. Cedia posted a very informative episode of their podcast in which they talk with designer Dennis Erskine, or Erskine, Erskine, yeah. Erskine or whatever, about the new uh, reference grade home theater they're constructing at Cedia's headquarters in Indiana. Cedia has a headquarters. They do. <laughs> Just the they have a headquarters. <laughs> Naturally, this is an all-out design with fully soundproofed room within the concrete shell, the projector, and its own isolated booth, and 30 speakers plus four subwoofers installed and, hin and hidden within false walls and columns. But Dennis explains the actual construction very clearly and also explains many soundproofing acoustic concerns, all of which are very applicable to any of our listeners who are constructing their own theater. So if you want to hear what is absolutely 100% over the top, this is it. But and then I was, you scale back from there. I was a little surprised how, like, not truly excessively over the top it is. Like, if you go and look at how they built the Oro 3D theater. Right, right, right. That's, like, that. insanity. That's, like, something no one could ever conceivably do in their house. But right. this one, other than they constructed, like, a full concrete shell and then built everything inside of that. Other than that... Everything they did within that concrete shell is totally stuff that you might do in a residential application, which was actually the point. Because he's like, mm. the idea of this is this is a home theater, not a, you know, something that you really would never see in somebody's home. Right. Unless it's absolutely insane. So I was really impressed by that. And yeah, if you want to hear like all the details, uh, how they did this, you know, whether you're going to have a separate room for your projector, that's probably above and beyond what most people are going to do. But still... Cons uh, hush boxes. Cons hush boxes. Yeah, sort conceivable. Of Somebody might okay. do that. But yeah, it was... It was Nice to hear it laid out really clearly, the full construction, what they did with the acoustics. And it's all stuff that you really might legitimately do, even as a, on a DIY basis in your own home. So, yeah, that was cool. Mm. I like that one. And we'll have a cool. link for that at avrant.com, or you can just check out uh, Cedia Podcast uh, for their website. 
All right, Aaron has a correction. He just wanted to make sure that we're all aware that the extension outputs on the Harmony Hub for connecting the additional mini blasters or precision IR cables actually use the even smaller 2.5 millimeter plug, not a 3.5 millimeter plug. So if you want to use the 3.5 millimeter to Ethernet adapter that we mentioned, just be aware that you also need a 3.5 to 2.5 uh, adapter. I think I knew that. But I, don't I think I remembered that it. slipped me because <laughs> I don't actually use my little extension blaster. Uh, he sent in a photo so that we can see the difference between a 3.5 and a 2.5. And of course, the 2.5 is smaller. It is smaller. Uh, but yeah, uh, Lee last week was excited by the whole uh, 3.5 to Ethernet adapter because he's like, oh, yeah, that's a really simple idea that makes a whole lot of sense if you want to extend something that uses a 3.5 millimeter jack. Because we've found that, you know, some of the 3.5 millimeter extension cables really don't have the best shielding. So right. if you're trying to extend that a long distance, it works well. But Ethernet works great. Uh, but yeah, if you want to do this with a Harmony Hub, You'll also need to convert the 3.5 to 2.5. This is not difficult or expensive, but it is a good thing to be aware of. So thank you, Aaron, for that correction. All right, let's get into the questions here. We have Nick. Nick says, thanks for taking, uh, I'm sorry, talking about HDMI 2.1 to an HDCP 2.3, but he'd like some further clarification. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, I'm all in on this question. Let's already. dig in. Let's suppose uh, we just focus on features as we said we ought to do instead of worrying about HDMI spec numbers. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say he gets a new LG C9 or C90, whatever. It'll be a C9 say. from LG. Yeah. Which uh, they've already said will support e, uh, EARC or uh, Enhanced Audio Return Channel That's and it. Variable Refresh Rate. And uh, let's say he gets an AV receiver that also supports those features and he gets something like an Xbox Scarlet when it comes out probably in 2020. I didn't know that was a thing, but okay. That's the code name for their next one after the Xbox One. It's it's coming it's up. We expect it's it good. in 2020. So we expect it to be the Xbox One A. Is that what it is? <laughs> I don't know is, what they're going to do. Is that what it's going to be? <laughs> <laughs> you know them. They'll probably just call it Xbox. And it'll be like, right. what about the original Xbox that was just Xbox? But yeah, we'll just, you know, we, we like to shorten little, it. A little X. Than Xbox, yeah, Big Xbox. Right. So it'll be the X Xbox. It'll or it'll be the Xbox, Xbox X. X. It'll be the well because they have the Xbox One X. So of course the next one will just be Xbox X. Right, the future <laughs> Xbox console will probably use HDCP 2.3. So could that end up rendering his variable refresh rate and EARC useless all because let's say the AV receiver in the single chain is the one device that doesn't support HDCP 2.3 so even though the TV receiver and source all support variable for refresh rate and EARC the features that we care about could uh, HDCP 2.3 make those features not work Yes, theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose we should say, I mean, we, we shouldn't guarantee we anybody that it that it's for sure going to work. Yeah, we don't know for sure. But if that handshake, if nothing is, if, if all the handshakes work together, right. I mean, that you have HGCP 2. Point whatever it is. 2.2 2 at, at the moment, yeah. At, and then they all work, then any feature should work. But if the, the 2.3 comes out and it says, uh, oh, no, that's... <laughs> this handshake is no longer working. We're going to kick you down to, and then that's what the, that's where it, the problem lies. What is it going to? Mm -hmm. What what features is it going to lock out when it right. does that? And yeah. we don't know that. Yeah, because they um. So yeah, the the covering our behinds answer is that of of course we have to say in case somebody's watching in this this in the future we can't guarantee that that it'll all work. However, logically. Right, you can get a TV right now from Samsung that does variable refresh rate. That's for sure. It does not have HDCP 2.3 at the moment, that Samsung TV. You can get an AV receiver that will pass through variable refresh rate right now that does not have HDCP 2.3. And you can use a player like an Xbox One X that does variable refresh rate that does not use HDCP 2.3. Okay, so all of that works right this moment. So let's say the only thing you upgrade in that signal chain is to the new Xbox, the Xbox Scarlet, because that's the official code name. Um, that comes out, let's say it does have HDCP 2.3, but we know that every chip manufacturer who has talked about HDCP 2.3 says that HDCP 2.3 is backwards compatible with HDCP 2.2. So at worst, it'll knock you back to what was supported under 2.2. Right. So if variable refresh rate already works on a current TV and a current AV receiver, both of which are using 2.2, not 2.3, I don't see, a, I mean, like I say, cover up behinds maybe, but there shouldn't be a scenario where the new player, even if it gets knocked back to 2.2, 
wouldn't still support the features that are currently no, supported I, right today. Right? I agree with you, but at the same yeah. time, they could say this is a feature that is a 2.3 feature and not, right. but, not natively supported or, you know, yes, they made it work with 2.2, <laughs> but it's not supposed to work with 2.2. <laughs> it's supposed to work with 2.3. Therefore, uh, we're going to lock it out. Yeah. They could do that. They could, it could yeah, that's, that's the covering our behinds answer. Yeah, um, if you think about... The, so the, the features where the full uh, HDMI 2.1 48 gigabits per, band, uh, per second bandwidth is required, uh, where HDCP 2.3 is definitely required, are the features like 4K resolution at 120 frames per second, the high frame rate, or 8K resolution. Those are the things that seem right. to be explicitly tied to the new copy protection the 2.3 version so let's say you get an xbox scarlet let's say it does support 4k at 120 we don't know if it will but let's just assume that maybe it does we know lg already said their c9 oled is going to support 4k at 120 and has the full bandwidth okay so those two things in the signal chain we know work but yeah, let's say you get an AV receiver. It's a new one. It claims that it passes through 48 gigabits per second, but for some reason it doesn't have 2.3. That feature, the right. 4K at 120, probably won't work in that scenario. Now, right. I haven't seen any products that have been announced that say they're going to have the full 48 gigabits per second of bandwidth, because now Samsung has a few that they've announced, uh, that do not include HDCP 2.3. I haven't seen a single one. They've all said that they do include HDCP 2.3. So the assumption is that when AV receivers with full 48 gigabits per second bandwidth come out, that they will also support HDCP 2.3. That's the assumption, but we could end up being wrong about that. <laughs> all right. Well, you just kind of answered this next question, though, didn't you? I think so. Yeah, that's pretty similar. Yeah, yeah, because that's all yeah. about the forty-eight gigs and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, okay. I mean, he was asking about the high frame rate. What basically the what would happen, right? Like, you got a TV that supports four K at one twenty. You've got something like an Xbox Scarlet or a PlayStation Five. Maybe those will do four K at one twenty. But you have this AV receiver in the middle of that signal chain and it says it can do 48 gigs but it doesn't have hdcp 2.3 for some reason the assumption would be you'd get knocked back to 4k at 60 because hdcp 2.2 allows 4k at 60 we know anything with hdcp 2.3 is backwards compatible so that that would be the assumption right all right on a different topic he came across a removable soundproof i'm, so, I'm sorry soundproofing window cover from trademark soundproofing well, it's in their name, so they must know what they're doing. <laughs> it's just a layer of vinyl with or without some fiberglass, depending on whether you, uh, you want it to be transparent or, or opaque, that you secure around your window frame using Velcro and optional hooks. What do we think? He can't permanently close off his windows, and this seems like a low-cost improvement versus the regular drapes. Worth giving them a try. Let me look at this thing here. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's quite literally just a piece of mass-loaded vinyl with some Velcro around the edges. They have some eyelets so that you can install some hooks to help support the weight. It looks like a doormat. Roll and you're it up. <laughs> Uh, hung from your available your... in some different colors including a transparent version but the transparent version of course doesn't have any fiberglass to provide any like just sort of little little teeny bit of absorption but not really sound blockage <laughs> i don't see why you don't just make a absorption panel which would be cheaper and more effective and just hang it over your window but that wouldn't and do then... much in the way of sound proofing they're claiming this has some sound proofing to it because it's a piece of mass loaded vinyl I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't think I don't I don't put much stock into that. I mean, it's a little bit like you know, if you go into an industrial warehouse and they have those you know, those vinyl curtains, you know, like in a meat packing place. Right? Yeah. I mean, those do cut down on some sound transmission, higher frequencies, not bass, but they do prevent some sound transmission through those doors because mass loaded vinyl is you know a fairly heavy solid substance, so that works all right for that. I think this would be a little better than just putting like a fiberglass panel over your window. I don't, how much do they cost? I they're not that expensive. I think they were like 30 bucks or something like that. I forget. Oh, for $30, dollars fine, that. whatever. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, I could give it a try. The, the one thing that I question about this, though, is, you know, they are su just secured around the perimeter with Velcro. And I'm like, so I guess you put Velcro on your 
window casing and a lot of window casings are kind of like ridged or patterned or stepped or something you know like not just yeah. a flat casing which how well is velcro really going to work on such a thing they show it attached to a casing but i think that's a, a flat casing that they're showing so i, I question that a little bit <laughs> the actual right. securement method <laughs> I, I, I don't it's, I don't I honestly don't believe this is going to be significantly better than just putting a panel up over this mm. window but you know if it's cheap and you want to give it a go it's not as thick yeah so there's that going for it yeah but I'm not it, super gung ho on it but I I could see it blocking a little bit more like let's say road noise you know something like that it's not going to do the base when a semi truck rolls by it's not going to do a darn thing about that right but if it's just like you know wind whistling or something like higher frequencies I could see it blocking a, a little bit yeah it might it, i don't know maybe it'll give you four decibels quieter or something which sometimes that's that's all you're looking for neil <laughs> from the scottish highlands uh i knew a scotsman once uh -huh. when i lived in australia he was it took me forever to understand anything he said mm. but i all i did find out very early in our relationship that the more he drank the better i understood him oh so it's it's often the opposite but it is often the opposite but not in this case the so. accent gets thicker Ian was his name. He has passed recently. So oh, that's very true. nice man. Uh, played rugby with him. He's Jerry, he, he invited me to the geriatric rugby league. Nice. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay. It was touch. It wasn't oh, okay. tackle. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Neil. We recently recommended going for a Samsung Q8 FN instead of the Q6 FN because the Q8 offers full array local dimming. One of the advantages we mentioned is that the letterbox black bars look better and remain blacker on the full array set. Neil has a Samsung JS8500 and a Q6 FN. One of the JS's features is a setting called Cinema Black that's specific, uh, specifically for letterbox, letterbox bars. Well, the JS8500 is a is edge-lit. The LEDs are arranged on the two sides rather than being on the top and bottom. As such, the LEDs at the very top and the, the bottom of the two sides can be completely turned off, creating very black letterbox bars. His Q6FN does not have cinema black option in the ratings. <laughs> yes, they are. They do call themselves ratings, but they spell it R-tings. Yeah. Noted that all of the Q6FN's uh, edge LEDs are along the bottom of the TV, but its black bars look just as good as his JS8500. So, is full array local dimming is a full array local dimming model any better? Does the Q6FN somehow have an equivalent to this in the black option, even though his LEDs are along the bottom rather than the two sides, uh, two side edges? Uh, okay, so just so that we're all clear here. Full array local dimming means that instead of having it, the there's a number of lights in the back mm -hmm. <laughs> that will illuminate the uh, the uh, the you'll basically pass through the LEDs or whatever the LCDs the, yeah the LCDs and the those different lights can be turned off so they have and the more of those lights you have the more zones that you have the more lights you can turn off in order to not so there's not as much bleed through. Um, <clears throat> the edge lit ones are essentially the the LEDs are along the edge. They shoot in from the sides. It allows your TV to be thinner, mm -hmm. which is if you're worried about thinness. And uh, but the, generally you have problems with black levels, and uh, the center of the image sometimes can be dimmer than the edges of the the, the image for the, the exact same reason. Uh, now I don't know. Basically, you're comparing two different edge lits together and saying that they both look similar right but you're not comparing them to a full you know uh, uh you know like a uh, an, uh, an oled an oled like an oled which has you know, each one is their own little each light pixel, source so yeah you, yeah <laughs> that's so you like... can turn each one off yeah yeah so yeah you're saying that these both look pretty similar and that's great it probably has more to do with you know this the room that you're looking at them in than it does anything else that's a significant because part of it yeah if uh if you're looking at them in a completely black room, are you know they and they look similar? You're like, okay, well, you know, they're both edge lit, and yes, you could turn those the side ones off there, but there's still going to be bleed mm -hmm. from the other the other ones. So, you know, maybe you know it isn't doing that great of a job, but you're not comparing it to something that is truly giving you black. I mean, black should be, it should be just as dark as the 
is the sides of you know, yeah, the, the bezel. bezel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's any brighter than that, then it is not black. Which, which is the case with OLED. When when you have black bars on an OLED TV, uh, the black bars are every bit as black as the bezel around the TV, and you just you cannot tell where the the TV screen begins and the bezel begins. You, they they just match up perfectly. Uh, yeah. There's a number of factors at play. So. Yeah, think about it. You're on a 16 by 9 TV, but you're watching a CinemaScope ratio movie, so it's got black bars at the top and bottom. Uh, on an OLED, every individual pixel can be completely turned off if you want it to. And then, so like right at the bottom edge of the top black bar, the pixel just below that that actually is lighting up, it's completely independent from the one pixel just above it that's now a black bar, which means the black bar is completely black and the pixels below it are lit. So that's the ideal. Then you go to full array local dimming on a liquid crystal display. And here you have individual lights that can be turned off, but they are directly behind the LCD. And then you also have the LCD, which is doing its best to block any light that comes through. Now, even on a full array local dimming set where you can turn off the lights that are within the black bar portion, you still get a little bit of bleed, right? When you have that one pixel just below the black bar and it's as bright white as it can possibly be in HDR at like 4,000 nits or something, a little bit of that light still bleeds up into the black bar, even on a full array local dimming set, because you still have a much larger light source than the individual pixels, right? You're talking maybe five or 600 LEDs at best versus 8 million individual pixels. So right, right. obviously one LED is illuminating many, many pixels, including bleeding a little into black bars. Now we take that a step further. You have edge LEDs and ones that are on the side. So, okay, they're shooting their light in from either side. And you can say, okay, the LED at the very top and the LEDs at the very bottom, we turn those off so they're not shooting light directly into the black bars. But then the LEDs just above them, still on the sides, are shooting their light in and a little bit bleeds into the black bars. And then worst case scenario, you get to like a Q6FN and you have all of the LEDs along the bottom shooting up which means that black bar at the bottom is never black, right? All right. the light has to be shooting through it to illuminate the cinemascope portion in the middle. Now, why could the Q6FN still look just as good as the JS8500, even though it, there's never a chance it's turning off the LEDs that are illuminating that bottom black bar? It, that's never going to happen. How does it still look as good? Well, that comes back to the actual LCD panel itself, which is doing its best. It acts like little shutters on a window to try and block the light. And it, as it turns out, the current QLED models, the Q6, Q7, and on up, their LCD panels natively are better at blocking the light than your older JS8500. So you combine the not quite as good shutters with the better backlight on your JS8500 versus the worse backlight but better shutters on the Q6FN and the end result is similar, which is right. not super surprising. Uh, yeah, so you combine that with maybe having ambient light in your room and your eye being biased so that it doesn't totally see that the black isn't truly black, that it's actually gray, and it all looks quite similar. So that's basically the explanation. Okay. Brian. First up, Brian wanted to let us know that he decided to go with the Fluence RT83 record player. So he was asking us about a vinyl, you know, vinyl yeah. solution, and it was the... He was he, asking about he, Fluence, and we were pointed to the Audio-Technica, which is right, the right, Fluence right. certainly appears to be based on. <laughs> right, right. And he says he's happy with the purchase, so I think that's what we said. It really didn't matter. Well, yeah, it's a about. very nice-looking player, and if it is based on that Audio-Technica, it works really well, so yeah. I would see no reason to not be happy with it. So he's continuing to build his two-channel music system. He's, he's in need of a CD player. What should he get? Some dedicated CD players only have analog outputs. He's considering the NAD C58. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Is that going to fix that? No? I don't know what's wrong with my voice today. I think I got coffee stuck in there. Uh, the NAD C538 that has both analog and digital outputs. So he could potentially use a separate DAC. Wow. Just scurrying down that rabbit hole yep. is he overthinking this could some 20 year old cd player sound everybody good as good for way less money or could just about any blu-ray player any sound just as good player yep. <laughs> yeah really you do not need a dedicated cd player you need oh, yeah. a player that's just ones and zeros and if it's going out digitally yeah i mean if you want to go out, out analog then you have to care about the analog outputs but mm. really the dax inside these things have been fine for the last 
forever. So don't worry about it. Just <laughs> yeah, you, know. you you are overthinking it, in my opinion, Brian. Yes. Uh, now yes. I will say this though: when you're playing a CD, there's a there's a disc physically spinning in a player. And some players, you can hear the disc spinning versus others that are a little bit better build quality or that. You know, they're they're much closer to silent just as far as the, the mechanics of spinning the disc. That's, if the thing's not sitting next to you, which well, it shouldn't be. Who knows? Though? Maybe, be. You're, maybe it's very close. You know, you got all your equipment just in front of you and you're only six or seven feet away. I, I can sometimes hear certain disc players that physically spinning. So I might care a little bit about that. But in terms of as long as you can read the CD, which essentially anything that can play discs of any type can read the CD. Uh, as long as it can do that and output it digitally, that's all going to be identical. If, if it's coming right. out digitally, there is zero difference to be had. If it's coming out analog, there is the possibility that you could have noisier analog outputs or something like that. Worrying about the digital to analog converter... This is CD. This is like, <laughs> this is the most basic. This like if if your digital analog converter cannot convert forty four point one kilohertz sixteen bit perfectly to an analog signal at this point, I don't know what you're buying. That's that yeah. would be outlandish to me. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I mean, I suppose if you're building a two channel system, you might have opted to go with a pre amplifier or a two channel integrated amplifier that has no digital inputs. Those exist. Uh, sure. I personally wouldn't opt for that. I want nope. any of my digital sources to just output the signal digitally and allow my stereo integrated amp or my pre processor or whatever. I want that thing to take in the digital signal and do all the digital analog conversion itself. Uh, that way I don't have to worry about what player I use. As long as it can output digitally, it'll be perfect as far as the player is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Brandon. Brendan's trying to wrap his head around what pressurization actually means when we oh. use the word. In it. Did I skip something? So, well, no, should we mention to Brian? I mean, I, I do like Sony's Ultra HD Blu-ray player as a player, <laughs> which is cr still crazy overkill, but less expensive than the NAD you were considering. And that'll play super audio CDs, DVD audio discs, Blu-rays, because yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe you want to listen to a concert Blu-ray. Ultra HD Blu-rays, maybe you want to listen to an Ultra HD Blu-ray concert. So it's just the fact that it plays every conceivable type of disc. And if you go with the X800 or the upcoming X800 M2, it has very nice uh, build quality with a, not silent disc spinner, but you know, quiet disc spinner mechanically so uh, i'll recommend that to you and please 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 don't fall into the the the, the line of thinking that somehow being able to do more means that you can't do the thing that you care about <laughs> as well you know oh i want to dedicate a cd player because i just wanted to concentrate on being a cd player and not worry about these other things it's a machine it doesn't get distracted by the fact that it can do other things it it can take the ones and zeros that are on the disc off of the disc yes just as well as a dedicated player can do there is no difference there and you know basically you know the external dax don't make any difference none Not of the stuff this, no. makes any difference you know all the people that are out there are like oh well i've got this and i've got these cables running between them and this and that it's I'm glad. I'm glad they enjoy their hobby so much, and I'm not saying that they're bad people or that they've uh, that they're somehow you know wasting their money. If it's their money and they get <laughs> they get joy out of it, it's not yeah. a waste to me. It's a. I mean, as far as how much difference sonically it made, it made zero sonic difference. Yeah, it's it's an unnecessary expenditure, but yeah, if it changed the brain waves in your head, then it's real to you. So I see people driving around in cars all the time where I'm going. That car in this town sure, yeah. never goes over 75 miles an hour. True enough. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm glad you have a V12. I don't know what you think you're going to do with it around here, but I'm glad you got it. So it's the same thing. Actually, it's not even the same thing because it's... I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck talking now. Brian, because I'm going to start getting angry. Brian, first up, Brian, when the last Brian, day they decided... Brandon. Uh, I have a Brandon. I scrolled back up to look at his question. And then I started the question again. I realized... Brandon's trying to wrap his head around what pressurization actually means when we use the word in describing which subwoofers we are recommending for a given room size. Are we literally just talking about some measurement of volume uh, uh, volume output per cubic foot? Am I supposed to keep going or is that the end of that question? Because I'm a little confused by how well, this Well, I guess we could, we could pause there for a moment because he gives examples yeah. that to dig into, but we, yeah, we, can, we can answer that directly. Well, yeah. I mean, basically, the amount of output it can give into a room, the, the, the volume of air it can move, and 
you know, depending on the amplifier size, the driver size, you know, uh, how, what it can do. That you look at that, and then you look at how big, how much air there is in the room, and if it can move all that air, it can pressurize a room because it yep. needs to move it all. And to basically. to displace that air, because that's what we're talking about is air displacement. So when you have more air, you have to displace more air, and to do that, you either have to have a larger driver moving just as much as the smaller driver, or the same size driver moving more. That's the only way you can displace more air. So yeah, if you just have a larger room, there is more air to displace and you have to do that with a larger driver and or a driver that moves in and out more. All right. So he's got a couple of scenarios here. So you, he says, first, you're in a small enclosed room sitting maybe 10 feet away from front speakers. So we'd be saying, and he's talking about us, mm -hmm. that basically any regular bookshelf speakers would let us reach full reference volume, correct? Yeah. And then because it's a small enclosed room, we'd be saying that a fairly small subwoofer would be sufficient to fully pressurize that room, correct? Well, okay, so the f sitting 10 feet away is what matters to the speakers. The small enclosed room is what matters to the subwoofer. Mm -hmm. The speaker is trying to move the air between you and it because that, that's going to go past you and then bounce, start bouncing around the room and doing other things. But that's we're not worried about that. It doesn't have to pressurize that entire room in order for you to hear the sound. The subwoofer is omnidirectional. It's going, it, ha it goes all over the room at the same, basically, essentially the same time. So we care about the speaker, how far the distance is because it, we're looking at direct sound, sound directly from it to you. The, the subwoofer that those wavelengths are so long yes that that your room is not encompassing a single wave you know they it's gonna ba start bouncing around the room before it finishes that first wave so that's why we care about the size of the room as far as the subwoofer yeah, so you're, to, you're correct to both dig these in, things are correct to dig into it a little bit um so with a short wavelength, a high frequency will have a short wavelength. Now, our brain needs to, our eardrum needs to move back and forth at least a couple of times, right? If it just, if you give it one frequency and it's like a super short chirp and your eardrum just moves back and forth once, our brain won't really register that. You might get an inkling that something happened, but you won't really be able to tell anything. It needs to do it at least twice and usually more than that. Now, if it's a very short wavelength, a very high frequency... Uh, sounds traveling at about 1100 feet a second. You can round that down to be like, basically it's moving at one foot per millisecond. And if it's a short little frequency, a uh, short little wavelength, the high frequency is coming out of the speaker uh, and you're sitting 10 feet away. By the time the sound, the very first little movement of the tweeter uh, you know, it pushed the air forward a little bit and then it pulled it back. <laughs> That's what's going on. But that wave propagates forward. It's done that multiple times before that very first little pressure front ever reached your eardrum. It, it, it had mu multitudes of time. It had lots of time to move back and forth multiple times before it, uh, that very first little pressure wave ever reached your eardrum and then all the ones coming after it. So that direct sound is going right from that tweeter driver to your eardrum. You didn't have to wait for it to bounce around a room or anything like that. But if you're talking about something at 20 hertz, which is a 55 foot long <laughs> wave, that's, yeah. that's the length of the wave. It, for your eardrum to have moved back and forth twice, it means that wave, it, it went right past you. It bounced off your back wall. It came back. If you're in a small enclosed room, it went off your back Let's wall. Let's say you're in a 10-foot room. It's going to go back and forth <laughs> five, five times. Five and a half times. Five and times a half times. Before, before it... Yeah. Before it it's finished its first wavelength. And yeah, and that your ears only move back and forth once. It has to do it once. again. Yeah. So the... the room this answers size, the second question, yeah, too. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I was going to kind of wait for that, but I, I want to get that... So in your mind, the idea that these waves are very long and they're mo they're all moving at 1,100 feet per second. The speed doesn't change. But think about how far it travels when it's 55 feet long versus, say, a 1,000 hertz tone, a 1 kilohertz tone, which is 1.1 feet long. Right. right. Much so the subwoofer, needs to, the, the, the subwoofer needs to be able to push, the, move the air in your room, all of it, so that that wavelength can go back and forth <laughs> five and a half times in your 10-foot room. Yeah. I mean, 11 times it's for your 11 brain times to actually for, register it. Right, before your, your brain register it. So why does the subwoofer size matter compared to room? Because it's the amount of air that's in the room. The air of the the, air, the direct air that's being moved between you and the subwoofer driver. Speak, yeah. The regular, yeah, that's, I mean, any subwoofer can do that. Sure. But, you know, what it's not able to do is keep that 
all that air moving enough so that your brain can actually register all these different, uh, all the waves that you need to register in order to really, uh, you know, feel it and yeah. understand. And it. And remember, yeah. as these sound waves are moving back and forth through through the room, they're losing energy. It's an inverse yeah. square law. The farther it has to travel, you multiply, right? It's squared. The amount of energy lost is, is a, a square of the distance that it travels. So we're talking about this thing having to travel 110 feet before you ever hear it versus the one that only had to travel 10 feet. That's a lot more energy that you need to generate yeah. for it to move that much. So do I need to do the second one? Well, yeah, uh, because it's, it's a good can. example yeah. just to further clarify. So let's imagine that we have a theater area that is exactly the same size with exactly the same seating distance from the front speakers, but now the theater area is within a larger room, not open to the whole house, but just a larger room. It seems though we say the exact same speakers are still sufficient. That is true. But we'd say that a, a larger, higher output subwoofer would be necessary, which is also true, even though everything within the theater area might be exactly placed exactly the same as when it was in the small enclosed room. So how does that make sense? Are we literally just saying that because the room got bigger, the subwoofers need to play louder to pressurize? Yes. Uh, if that's the case, why don't the speakers also need to play louder? We answered that already. If we're saying the same speakers are okay, but the subwoofers now need to play louder, won't that sound imbalanced? No, because we are talking about the amount of energy that's being lost yeah. as the sub as the sound wave is bouncing around your room. You know, it has to, it, you have to move that much more air. And that takes that much more energy, which means it, there's going to be more energy lost and the subwoofer will not sound uh, as loud. Yeah, we have to care about the end result is how much does your eardrum move? That's what ultimately right. matters. How much does your eardrum move? So with the higher frequencies that have lots of time to move back and forth a couple of times before they j just that pressure wave from directly from the tweeter or directly from the mid-range driver in a straight line to your eardrum, right? At lots of time, we don't have to worry about what sounds reflected off other walls or that. that. That wave can just go in a straight line from there to your ear. So that amount of air movement is the same regardless of the size of the room. But with... The base frequencies, this 55 foot long, 20 hertz wave, you know, even if you're, so you went from a room that's got 10 foot dimensions to a room that's got 30 foot dimensions, much, much larger, much, much more energy lost by the time the sound, you know, travels that extra distance, inverse square law. But to get your eardrum to move the same amount, <laughs> you have to move all the air out, all the air back, all the air out, all the air back. So that the, the end result of how much your eardrum moves is what's matter. And you got all this extra air that has to move because it has to go past you off wall and back to your eardrum. So Brandon heard me talking about using my Xbox One to listen to Atmos. What services work with Atmos on the Xbox One? Netflix, Amazon Prime. What service uh, or services was Tom referring to? I was referring to Netflix because okay. uh, that's the only... I, I'll be honest with you. I love Amazon Prime for shipping. Sure. <laughs> Their streaming service is is just awful. I just <laughs> it's just so bad. I can not get it to lip sync. That's correctly. that's I, coming up if we get to that question. I have not been able to do it. Now, what I have done, like I was watching Mr. Robot mm -hmm. or um, I Robot or whatever the name of the Probably show Mr. Was. Robot. Yeah. And which was a great show. And I it was the lip sync was driving me nuts, mm -hmm. so I fixed it. And I fixed it on Amazon Prime and it messed it up for everything else. Right. Everything else was off. Like everything. YouTube, uh, Netflix, Twitch, all of it. Mm -hmm. Everything else was wrong, but Amazon Prime worked. I'm like, well, this is not good. I can't have a setting for Amazon Prime and a setting for everything else. I would just keep the everything else and then Amazon Prime, I just have to sit here and... Tolerate. Try not to try not to stare at their lips as they're not as the sounds coming out way sooner. Yeah, have you have you given it a try on Xbox One and seen if I mean they only have one show in Atmos, don't they? Isn't Jack Ryan the only show they have in Atmos? I did, I started watching Jack Ryan and I did not like it, so right. I have not gone back to watch and it. Didn't really now, notice like whether that worked through the Xbox. No, I, I didn't. Really. Uh, was the Xbox One included in CNET's thing of which streaming boxes work with uh, with Atmos? Um, I don't remember. I don't recall, but uh, yeah, I'll, I can look that up in the meantime. But we, yeah, we know it works with Netflix for sure. That one for sure. But uh, yes, and uh, they tentatively, I'm going to say that they seem to have fixed everything on with the sound because it no ah. longer says Atmos ever. Oh, unless it actually <laughs> is Atmos. Unless it's actually Atmos, it now says 7.1 channel. Oh, okay. PCM. Okay. Or, so yeah. the automatic switching. 
seems, seems to seems to be there seems now. to have been addressed. I mean, I've never with... taken my Xbox One out of stereo mode because I just I don't use it that often. I got a bunch yeah. of other streaming things, so I don't use it that often. Okay, what? Oh, they do have it here. And uh, so Cena is saying that Xbox One will do Atmos with Netflix, Vudu, and Amazon Prime. So there it is. Okay. That's that's according go. to CNET, that'll work. Okay, I don't have anything in Vudu that is Atmos. Don't have to worry about ah. it. All right, Jim. Jim is a friend who wants to set up a two-channel speaker system for music. This, you know, you know this music and movies. I'm just going to throw that out there. This friend likes his music loud and wants decent bass since small speakers and Bluetooth speakers haven't been cutting it. He's got a Yamaha receiver on hand. It's a bit older, but this is just for two-channel. So Jim figures it should be fine. Jim's friend has around 800 bucks for the speakers. So they're considering Def Tech or Definitive Technologies uh, BP9020 towers. They have a self-powered data inch subwoofer built into each tower, and they fit the budget. But Jim was also thinking of recommending something from Klipsch. What do we suggest? Well, I mean, we suggest a subwoofer, but, uh, you know. Yep. I just... <laughs> this... <laughs> I mean, it, 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 so whenever somebody gets into the two-channel-only world, this this inevitably comes up. Right. Yeah, the whole idea. So it always comes up with the the whole idea that okay, well, I only want two channels, so I'm going to get tower speakers and let them do the bass. Well, it doesn't. I mean, they just don't do the bass as well. <laughs> it's what it comes down to. Well, it's, it's, they don't do the bass as well. It's that you're so, in a room. The pro right. the problem isn't n inherently having your speakers play bass. The problem is that you're in a room, and that room is very likely not 110 feet in every direction. <laughs> that would be it. Right. One heck of a room. So that if that being the room. case, and we, we talked about this, how long those bass wavelengths are and the fact that what ultimately reaches your ear is never direct sound that just made a straight line from the subwoofer built into your tower to your ear, it's impossible because the wave itself is far too long. It will have bounced off of walls and ceiling and floor in your room. And the end result that reaches your ear is not uniform linear base when you have originated that sound from where you would put tower speakers to have good stereo imaging for the high frequencies that can make essentially a straight line from the speaker to your ear. So what Jim didn't tell us was the how far away this guy is going to be standing from these speakers. And the size of the room. And the size of the room. But so, he wants it to play loud, which, okay, that's fair enough. And he wants to have some decent bass. I mean, speakers are not like engines on cars. The bigger it does not give you more power, necessarily. Mm. You know, it, a bookshelf speaker can play very, very, very loud. If you have a good, you know, good amp behind it, it can play very loud. And, and the, the high efficient. Yeah, because you're looking more for that efficiency rating mm -hmm. than anything else, which is why you started thinking, Jim, of clips. And sure. horn speakers in general can play very, very loud. Mm -hmm. or they, you know, they have that ability, you know, that the the sensitivity is usually so high and that you shove two watts in there you're like okay turn it down that's good uh but if you're worried about bass you got to think about a subwoofer and that subwoofer is the thing that's going to take care of everything below 80 hertz and it's going to do it much better than any floor standing speaker with eight inch subwoofers yeah in it because you can to position do. it in your room so that it works with your room instead of against it right so, uh, I mean, 800 bucks, you know, you can go, you need to get, uh, think, of, think of subs here, you know, I guess the, the SVS, one, the thousand, yeah, maybe 1000, so that's $500 out of the budget right there. And then 300 bucks for bookshelf speakers, mm -hmm. you get something that's home reloaded from, uh, well, I mean, if you could find some clips on sale or something, sure. like that, I guess you could do that. But I was also uh, thinking it, shoe, HSU. Yeah. The HSU ones would work as well. Very nice. Uh, how much are those, though? Are they $300 a pair? They're a little bit more than that, aren't they? Uh, so uh, at the moment, the HB1 Mark IIs from Shu are at, uh, they're on sale right now. So they're at $280 for a pair. So that would, that would work go. at the moment. That's my recommendation. Yeah, I can dig that. Uh, and yeah, we're assuming that this being a two-channel only setup that you probably only care about one seat. That's right. almost always the case. So, In which case, you can use one sub for one seat as long as you have placement flexibility for where you're able to position that subwoofer in the room. That's uh, right. But that should work quite nicely. So it's, you know, interesting twist here. We're saying actually spend a, a significant amount more. If we're talking a percentage out of $800, we're saying spend significantly more on the subwoofer and then get a nice pair of bookshelf speakers. Now, 
I don't know. Maybe this is a two-channel system where you care about more than one seat, or you know, we're almost always in favor of using two subs anyway. Is there a way you could get two subs and some nice speakers that probably won't play as low or quite as loud as the PB-1000 will, but you could do it. And there is an option, which is you could look at Dayton's sub-1200. Okay. Those go for about uh, $150 each. Now, those will not really play below 25 hertz, but for music only content below 25 hertz content below 32 hertz for that matter in music yeah, only just, yeah pretty rare uh right. and that sub 1200 is is quite a comp uh you know competent sub so you could get a pair of those for 300 bucks leaving you about 500 dollars. now you could go for i would po still point you to shoe but you could actually get two of their hc1 the one that is you know marketed as a center speaker but it's the dual woofer and tweeter design which you can absolutely turn vertically and just use as large bookshelf speakers and that would be about five hundred dollars for a pair of those so options here but we're basically pointing you at good subwoofer maybe a pair of the daytons or just one of the pb 1000s from uh svs and then some shoe horn loaded speakers and let's let's just head this next question off at the pass which is going to be but i wanted that sub for music so i should get a sealed sub right no <laughs> The subwoofer does not care it really that it does has not. a hole in it or it, it, that makes no difference. It makes very little difference. And this whole idea that a sealed sub is somehow cleaner, tighter, faster, whatever, it's just... I mean, there was a time when that was kind of true because... It, it's just like when people talk about amplifiers and they're like, yeah. oh, Yamaha sounded like this and didn't sound like that. I'm like, okay, maybe 50, 40 years ago yeah. that, that had some validity to it. But... I first of all, I've never heard it, so I, I I don't I haven't I can't attest to it one way or the other, and it's certainly not true anymore. Yeah, you know, you talk about a subwoofer from SVS or any reputable subwoofer manufacturer uh, at this time, their amplifiers are perfectly capable of stopping that driver on a dime, don't... and they know how to tune a port now and right. build the correct enclosure size to have it all work nicely without sounding bloated or slow or any of the other things that people still people latch on to. Because I mean, there was a time when the, like, the very first subwoofers were coming out and they weren't very well understood and they were all placed horribly, which also contributed to this right. feeling of things. So it was generally that you had these sealed subs that, yes, because it's a you know uh, contained air and essentially acting as a spring, it did help to... I mean, we didn't have these super high powered but inexpensive amplifiers at the time either that was where you right. were trying to power a large woofer with like 25 watts because that's what we had at the time <laughs> in a box that we didn't know how to design that leaked air all over the place and made noises of its own so it was actually kind of beneficial if you didn't play anything below 40 hertz because it just started sounding bad like there's right. a multitude of things that people are still holding on to in the two channel world that just aren't true anymore so wives' tales is what it is. You know, pe people have said it so many times that it must be true. It's the you people I mean? who've heard it. Still keep saying CD sounds bad. It's like, yeah, the very first CDs sounded pretty crappy. That was that was kind of true. Things have gotten better in the past thirty years. Yeah. Christian from Facebook. Christian has a small room, 10 by 12, and it's enclosed. The door's on his back wall, and he closes it when he's listening. He's got SVS Prime Towers, too big, but fine, and the Prime <laughs> Center up front along with a PB1000 subwoofer. That is a lot of subwoofer for that room. <laughs> a friend of his keeps trying to talk him into getting a second PB-1000, but Christian is thinking that his room is small, so he doesn't need so much sound being blasted his way. And he doesn't want to spend $500 unless he's going to hear a really worthwhile difference. He says he cares about two seats in, his, in his, this room. What's our advice? It's not about how much sound is being blasted because it's, right. be, it's going to be... You're going to take those two subwoofers and calibrate them so that they are giving you the same volume. It's just going to be more even across both those seats. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember this this question coming in. The first thing I, yeah. I, I asked him was, how many seats you care about? Because mm -hmm. if you only care about one seat, mm -hmm. just like we said before, then you can go with one sub. As soon as you start caring about more than one seat, you know, you, you have a sub in here right now. Mm -hmm. Sit in one seat, see how it sounds. Sit in the other seat, see how it sounds. If it sounds okay to you, then you're fine. Yeah. If you're like, this one seat sounds terrible, and this other seat sounds really good. Well, you need a second sub. And it can be hard to tell because sometimes people are only listening to real content, which of course doesn't necessarily play all the frequencies that might sure. get played. So put a bass sweep on. Play a bass right. sweep. You can go to audiocheck.net to make your own bass sweep, or you can just find a bass sweep on YouTube and play that. 
and listen to that bass sweep play on repeat in both of your seats and you will likely find even though you're only one seat away that one seat away you have a different response you're going to have different humps and dips in that a bass sweep depending on which seat you're sitting in now that shouldn't be the case the signal didn't say to sound different depending on which seat you're in the signal right. said to sound the same no matter which seat you're sitting in the only way to achieve that uniformity in both seats is to have two subs this is a good friend a good friend of yours well and you've got a, you may be looking at that pb 1000 saying i can't fit another one of these in mm. my room which is pro likely the case it's not small uh, it is not small but your room is small enough that the SB1000 would be just fine. That's true. Yes. So, the, you know, if you're thinking to yourself, I can't fit another, you know, huge box in my room. Well, I mean, you could sell that first one and get two <laughs> SB1000s. <laughs> That's if, true. Yeah. If, if, you have, if you haven't had it for too long, maybe you can call SVS and see if I'll take it back. But uh, and get the two SB1000s and have two smaller subs. And performance-wise, you're not going to notice a huge difference. Not in this room. Uh, That's right. Not in this room. So, you know, getting that smaller box, like we give you our blessing to oh, get absolutely. the smaller sub. Yes. And it's not because it's sealed and faster or whatever, better for music. It's f because it simply it's has It's physically power. smaller, but still has adequate output for this small room size. Right. Yeah. So that, I know, that's price wise, I think they're about the same. So well, they are the I, same. Yeah. They're both $500, they, they, including shipping. Yeah. So I, I, it's not going to save you any money, but it will save you some floor space. <laughs> yeah, so. and the last part of this is because, you know, this this sounds like perhaps you're not familiar with all the things that we often say and talk about with dual subs. You want those two subs to be across the room from each other. You don't want them both up front. You don't want them both on the same side wall. That is still can be better than just a single sub as far as uniformity goes, but for the physics of how sound waves work, what you want to do is have the two subs on opposite sides of the room from one another. It appears as though right now you have your PB1000 in your front right corner. Directly across the room would be your rear left corner. That is where you would want to place the other sub yeah. if that is at all possible. So if they're, it, it, if they're in the midpoint of a wall, mm -hmm. then you put it in the midpoint of the other wall. That's right. But if they're in a corner, put it in the opposite corner. A diagonally so in, opposite it, corner, yes. Diagonally opposite. And if they're a little, like if the, yours are, fine but it's for other people if you have one subwoofer that's like not exactly in the corner maybe it's a couple of feet in from that corner then in the back of the room a couple of feet in from that opposite corner yeah. is where you'd want to, you basically mirror them yeah is what you want all right josh as a reminder josh originally asked about setting up a 2.2 home theater area within a larger room with two sliding glass doors one of which is never used so his home theater is going to be in front of that never used glass door the rest of the room is larger but not open to the entire house so it's a big room, whatever. Fairly large room, but theater area within it. Yes. Yeah. So we ended up making some uh, unusual for us recommendations. That doesn't sound like us. We'd, uh, we said to get a smaller TV since he was considering an 82-inch edge-lit Samsung, but he's only seven, sitting seven feet away. Uh, we said to get the 75-inch full-array Samsung instead. It sounds like us. Mm. But we said in-ceiling surround speakers would be a good idea since he said gaming is important to him. And we said a single SVS SB3000 is the way to go subwoofer-wise subwoofer -wise, since he really only cares about his one seat. Okay, I'm just going to... So I, I, I'm just going to say you only care about that one seat, right? And this is true. Just remember that the, the, once the sound passes, <laughs> once you hear the sound, doesn't mean that nobody else in that room has to hear it. <laughs> so, so you it, it may be sound very good for you, but it may be like in the kitchen, everybody's like, I can't hear myself mm. thinking here. So, you know, <laughs> just uh, I'll be aware that that sound is filling that entire space and it's going to act differently in different right. places. I have a friend who's subwoofer and is home theater is sounds pretty good he's mm -hmm. only got the one it sounds pretty good in there but you go into his bathroom and it's like shaking the mirrors <laughs> in there right. it's crazy but it was like all the home theater equipment needs to stay just within the little home theater area right it only cares about the one seat it'd be preferable if it was physically smaller as opposed to gigantic so all of those things led us to say yeah you know a single sp3000 can make sense in this scenario yeah. right about the only normal for us recommendation was we made was to get a Denon uh, X3400H receiver from Accessories for Less. So, uh, some follow-ups. He thought everything was uh, we said was well-reasoned, and he appreciates the clarity. But something else we've made clear is that we recommend uh, OLED TVs. Uh, we said to get the 75-inch Samsung Q8FN instead of the 82-inch Q6FN. But what about the 65-inch C8 uh, OLED? So, he went from 82 to 75, and now he's thinking about 65? That's, yep. Yeah, but only seven feet away, so. 
Keep so it's a bright room, and he'll be gaming more than half the time. So a QLED or OLED? Oh. I thought that the I thought the Samsungs were better for gaming than the OLEDs were. Well, they've so at at this very moment because he he specifically mentioned the C8 OLED, right? So at this very moment, the Q8 FN from Samsung does have variable refresh rate, which he can use with his Xbox One X. The C8 OLED does not. However, the forthcoming C9 OLED that has been announced will have variable refresh rate. And the oh, uh, the new uh, QLEDs that are coming out for this year also retain variable refresh rate. So that, if you end up with a 2019 TV model, ends up kind of being a wash, the variable refresh rate part of it. So it right. ends up being more about... He, he, in his original email, said he's probably gaming about 60% of the time on this TV. Right. So it ends up being more about the amount that you're gaming and then this very bright room. Now, as far as just sheer light output, the whole comments about OLEDs not being as bright, I'm like, that's ridiculous. They're insanely bright. They're way brighter than any 1080p TV you ever had. So right. th that I don't find to be a valid argument. But the Samsungs do have the best anti-reflective filter of any TV out there right now. They're fantastic with their anti-reflective filter. Uh, but narrow viewing angles... However, he only really cares about one seat, so that's not a concern either. So it's pretty much gaming. Is gaming yeah. enough reason to go QLED instead of OLED and size? Because 75 versus 65 for the same price. Uh, in, in, it, my reaction, my gut reaction to this is go with the Samsung. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a couple of things. The size is part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know what kind of gaming he does, but if there's a HUD that is always yeah. on the screen, you know, o o o o OLEDs are not... I mean, they're, I don't want to start perpetuating the, the idea that they are super susceptible to burning. Because they really are. not. Yeah. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. That's right. I've, I've seen it. Yeah. You know, I've seen it at, you know. Whereas you OLED. really won't see it ever on a Samsung QLED. It's just, they so, burn it. That would just be a to me. That would be, it's that that's not a deciding factor, mm -hmm. but it's something that when I'm trying to decide between two things, you know, and it and I'm having a hard time, it might just kind of inch it a little bit towards the LED side. Yeah. So uh, the bigger size makes a bigger difference for mm -hmm. me, I think. And uh, and if I it, think if that's it the were only going to be the C8 OLED and not the C9, then the variable refresh rate matters too. There you go. Because you don't yeah. get the variable refresh rate on C8. On that burn-in tip, I wanted to mention, because uh, R-Tings, ratings, uh, they have uh, seemingly concluded their OLED burn-in test. They're, they're going to continue doing it, but they, they did sort of a wrap-up video. And it was interesting because... So, kind of, to me, humorously, the end results were like, yeah, that's exactly what every TV reviewer has been saying this whole time. However... Uh, it was it was interesting to see because the examples that they had, they had six different OLEDs playing different types of content. The worst by far was the one that had set to be the brightest and was doing nothing but CNN, I think it was, right? So it's got the right. ticker and the logo and that one had horrible burn in. Yeah. And yeah, that, that can happen. If that's what you do, don't get an OLED. If that's what you do, that, that was right. horrible. But it was interesting because they had two OLEDs that were doing nothing but video games. One of them was doing nothing but FIFA. So it was just that. And the scoreboard, which is always on screen, it was amazing. It had burned in, but really little in an entire yeah. year of playing these TVs 23 hours a day, doing nothing but that. And it, like, it was there, but it was minimal, uh, far yeah. less than what a plasma would have been. And then they had one that was doing nothing but first-person shooters, which did have a HUD, but it was like a semi-transparent HUD. Right. And it essentially had no burn in, which was a shock to everyone. Like I expected it to have some burn in after that what amount. They have sitting there playing the game for 23 hours. That's what Oh, it was <laughs> an automated thing, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so let's see that person, man. He's really good at FIFA now. But uh, uh, yeah, basically, you know, the worries about burn in are not as bad as some people feared, but it right. is possible. The thing here is you can get the larger size, you can get the VRR right now, you can get it for actually a slightly lower price at the larger size, and there's nothing about the QLED in your scenario that's really a detriment because you really only care about the one seat, you're right in front, and it has the fantastic anti-reflective filters. So Put that all together, I would still say to get the Q8 FN. Yeah. Since in ceiling speakers are his only option for surrounds, he initially thought he'd just leave this as 2.2 setup, but since we said gaming is a high priority, even in ceiling surrounds, although a compromise placement, would still be worth it. So a 4.1 configuration using a Denon 
X3400H receiver. Uh, he likes that idea. Mm -hmm. But if he's going to have the X3400H anyway, should he consider making use of his additional channels? Oh, here we go. Maybe 6.1 with in-sealing surrounds and surround backs, or maybe a 4.1.2 with in-sealing surrounds and one pair of in-sealing Atmos speakers. What do we think? And how should he place his four in-sealing speakers if he decides to install that many? I really don't see any reason to do this. I got to be honest with you, man. The, just, I've seen so many systems where they, the person said, I want all the speakers to be invisible. And they're like, okay, yep. well, we'll put them all on the ceiling for you. Great. Yep. That sounds great. And then the speakers are within inches of each other. I'm like, they're like, how is this going to be differentiated in your ear in any way, shape or form? But since it's, these are like flush in ceiling speakers and they are essentially going to be visually invisible, he can, he has the latitude. He has the freedom to put them just about anywhere he wants in this ceiling. Well, I mean, I, surround backs is about as far as I would go. Yeah. You know, yeah, I would not do anything more than that. And even that I don't think would make much of a difference. I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't think it's going to be a huge yeah, benefit I mean, if the them. money is there and it's really not a not a thing, it's not a, a tremendous great hassle or expense to go to having both surrounds and surround backs, all four of them being in ceiling. Uh, I mean, there's not really a downside. You can always just turn it, turn the surround backs off if it turns out to be a downside. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but if this is something where you're like. I'd have to squeeze a little bit to get those surround backs as far as budget or hassle goes. I'd be like, it's not really worth that. So it's yeah. it's basically, if this is no skin off your back, it can't really do any harm. So, right. yeah. So where would he put them? All right. So he's going to have in-ceiling surrounds. Where should those go? Those well, should be go to the sides of his couch, just a little bit behind his yeah. couch. So like one or two feet behind your couch and to the sides. And, and then the rears are going to go, you know, f you know f four or five feet behind the couch. Yeah. Uh, closer in basically in line with your your front speakers yeah is kind of maybe uh five it. feet apart from each other five or six feet apart from each other and four yeah. or five feet behind your couch for the surround bags that's there you go. that's that'd be fine yeah. and at most you have no space for you could put yeah. atmos up front if you really wanted to but as i don't front think heights i guess as front heights but i'm be honest with you i don't think sonically you would ever know they did anything yeah, ever the top middles are going to be so close to your side surrounds all being yeah. in the ceiling is kind of not worth it. No. I, yeah, I would do surround backs if you're going to do anything. There you go. Yeah. William. First up, William has heard us uh, complaining about the lip sync issues when watching the Amazon Prime videos. He has lip sync issues too. That's because Amazon Prime sucks. <laughs> uh, he uses uh, the built-in app on his Sony X8850 C TV, but his old AV receiver didn't have any HDMI input, so he used optical, and that setup had lip, lip sync problems when using the Amazon Prime video. Mm -hmm. He recently upgraded to a Denon S740H, so he decided to try using HDMI ARC, or Audio Return Channel. To get that working, he also had to turn on HDMI CC. He knows that we are not a fans. We're not fans of CC. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't really... I, I, I feel nothing about it one way or the other, except that whenever there's a problem, it's this is almost... It's like, so it's like often a problem causes child. problems, yeah. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, I love my children, but you are almost always at the heart of the, of the issues in this family. And... That doesn't mean I don't I, I, I don't like them. I just you know I just know who to look for when there's something <laughs> broken in the kitchen. He knows we're not fans of uh, CEC, but once he turned that on, he discovered the Amazon lip sync issues went away. Going back to optical, the lip sync issues were still there, so it seems as though HDMI ARC with CEC activated somehow fixes that. He isn't sure how, but it works in his case, so he's leaving well enough alone. Good on you. I'm glad, I'm glad that works. <laughs> Will you be turning on CEC, Tom, to see if Dude. it fixes Amazon? <laughs> well, no, 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 thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Will not do that. Okay. I'd rather just come But if, if you, dear listener, would like to give it a try, uh, be prepared that some other things in your system might break. But uh, if that fixes that, eh, eh, who knows? So since uh, HMI CEC wound up being helpful, he decided to try using it the way it was intended, using only his TV's, TV's remote that receiver powers on and he can control the volume. If he plugs his sources into his TV, he can select which TV inputs he wants to use. And the receiver automatically uses uh, ARC. So it all seems to be working quite nicely. But, <laughs> oh, there's a but, huh? Sometimes he wants to use AirPlay. As far as connecting his phone to the Denon via AirPlay goes, that works perfectly, but he was already watching something. But if he was already watching something on TV, the TV remains on. 
say his cable box input so he can't see the Denon's AirPlay music interface and when he wants to switch back since he's using only the TV remote he has to switch to the TV to some other input and then back to the input he wants so that the receiver automatically go back into HDMI ARC audio. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to have it so that when he switches to AirPlay the TV automatically shows the Denon's interface and when he's done using AirPlay the Denon automatically goes back to ARC. He doesn't want to buy a universal remote he just wants to use the TV remote it's mostly working but this AirPlay Play switching stuff is his last point of friction. I don't have a clue, dude. I have none. So a, it, as described, using the television's remote to control everything, the answer is no. There's no way yeah. to have it automatically go to... So like, let's say it's HDMI port 1 that has the audio return channel on it on your television, right? So you're already using HDMI port 2, let's say. That's where your cable box is plugged in. So you've tuned your television to HDMI port 2. It's still using the audio return channel, which is HDMI port 1. One, that's outputting the audio back to your AV receiver. Now yeah. you picked up your phone, you activated AirPlay, so your receiver is no longer using ARC, it's using AirPlay. But of course the right. television doesn't isn't aware of that, so it's still on HDMI port 2, still right. showing you your cable box interface. You want it to switch to HDMI port 1 so that now it's actually acting as a video input and showing you what's coming out of the receiver. You'd have to press the button on the TV's remote to do that. No way to have that happen automatically. Now, when you turn off AirPlay, you're saying you want the receiver to go back to ARC automatically. Nope, it's not gonna do that. It has to receive some kind of command to do that, which like you say, switching the... So if you did press the television's remote to switch to HDMI port one or whichever one it is that has the ARC on it, uh, that would happen, right? Now you'd have to switch TV inputs to whatever source you want that's plugged into the TV, which would automatically kick your receiver into HDMI ARC mode again. So really, we're talking about one button press on your TV remote to put it onto the ARC port when you're using AirPlay so that you can see the receiver's interface and then right. you'll switch back. Um, the only other way to do this would be to use the receiver's remote as your only remote instead of the TV's remote as your only remote. Right. Because you can, all you really need to be able to do is turn the TV on, right? You would plug all your sources into your AV receiver. That would always be feeding what is the TV's ARC port. So if you're ever using, say, the TV's built-in apps, but that's probably the problem. The AV receiver remote probably doesn't control the built-in apps very well, right? Right, right. And that's what I was going to say, too, <laughs> is that, you know, basically what you're asking, the you're ask, your TV is controlling, by using the TV remote, your TV is kind of controlling the receiver. Yeah, you but can it can use... only do certain things, like turn it on and control the volume. Volume, and that's it. It can't and get the, it to switch It's the same inputs. thing the other direction. Yeah. with the the receiver remote which is your receiver remote can turn your tv on and off mm -hmm. you know so probably change channels or whatever to, to the right channel or whatever and but that's about it yeah it's not going to be able to do any of the other stuff so you're kind of hosed i mean you got to choose and, and really this doesn't sound like it's that much of an issue and i mean this is a... something you could do with like a harmony remote right you program it to switch inputs to whatever you want with one button press but right yeah i mean really what this is is when you use airplay you're gonna have to use your tv's remote to put the tv to its hdmi port that has arc on it Right. That's really all you have to do, because then when you're done, you're going to select whatever source you want on your TV again, and that will automatically kick your receiver back into ARC. So, yeah, it's it's a minor workaround, but that's that's about all you can do in this scenario. Yeah. Luke on Twitter. Luke has uh, set up in a small enclosed room. Uh, it's basically a des desktop setup. But he's using a full 7.1 speaker configuration. He had, he put a date in sub 1200 and a pretty much the only available space for a subwoofer of that size. He managed to get the response. He's hearing a seat to sound quite balanced, but anywhere else in the room, the bass is way too loud. <laughs> Could adding a second sub across the room from a sub 1200 do anything to help with that? There's hardly any available space, but he could squeeze a sub 1000 in the spot across the room. We talked about how having two subs across the room from one another can create more uniform bass with about frequency response. Is he going to need really good EQ as well? Well, can having the second sub make the rest of the room sound the way it sounds at his, at his seat? Or is he going to end up with it too loud at his seat now too? Or maybe some third scenario where it doesn't sound good anywhere. <laughs> worth spending the money and worth adding a second smaller sub 1000 when this main sub is a sub 1200. Okay, so when you add that second sub and you place it properly, which he's talking about doing here, what you're not, what he, he's correct in this, in, in his worries here, 
you are not going to get a more uh, even frequency response guaranteed. What you're going to get yeah, is a more linear. It's not necessarily going to be a flat line. Yeah. You're not going to put that second sub in there and all of a sudden everything's flat. That's not what happens. Right. What happens is every, the seats are going to, each seat is going to sound more uniform, more the same, which means it has the same problems at every seat, which means your EQ, which is most of the time we talk about Odyssey, but like Y Power, Turn Off, one of the other ones, mm -hmm. they, they, they all do basically the same thing. Uh, Drac. You know, basically, your EQ can look at that and say, I can fix this. And it'll fix it for all the seats. Yeah. Or, you know, or I, I can fix it this much. And it'll fix it as much as it can for all the seats. And now all of your seats sound the same. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, they all sound better than they would have sounded had you uh, only had the one subwoofer in there, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Now, with one sub, you can place it. He, he's got it placed in the one place you can put it. Mm -hmm. And it so happens that that one seat sounds pretty okay. Mm -hmm. But when he adds that second sub... You're not gonna that sit, that sound that you're hearing at that seat is probably not gonna be the same. Yeah, it's gonna change. It's gonna change to something else, most likely. Uh, right. What you're hearing Which... at your seat will change, but once you get up from your seat and move elsewhere in the room, you'll be hearing a very similar thing, no matter where you move in the room. Right. So then, if you do then fix what you're hearing at your seat, so you got the two subs and you fix what you're hearing at your seat with some equalization, then you will hear. A, close to the same thing no matter where you are in the room. So you do end up at the result that you want, which is that you get up from your seat, move somewhere else, and it doesn't sound drastically different and horrible, but you will have to have fixed what you hear at your seat with some EQ, more than likely. Right. And that goes along to a second question. He's considering getting a dead-end receiver from Accessories for Less to replace his Onkyo TX-NR646. Would having at least Odyssey Multi-EQ XT be worthwhile be a worthwhile upgrade, and what would he be missing out on not having XC32 and sub EQHT? If he's going to go through the effort and expense of having two sub, is it a waste not to have the sub EQHT? It's not a waste. No, not at all. It's not a waste. Uh, if you, multi Q XT would make a big difference in mm -hmm. the uniformity that you're hearing. The sub EQ makes things like easier and has more, you know, has more filters on it, and it also, you know, does more in the bass than the multi QXT does. But either, you know, the XT would be, would be fine. I mean, in this, in this room, in this, uh, in, in this situation would be fine. Would I want the sub EQHT? Yes. <laughs> it's a I little would. more convenient. Yeah. It'll, yeah. it'll help you out. I mean, what did, what we're getting at is that to get the uniform base first, not the linear base yet, but the uniform base, you usually need to make some adjustments to each sub individually, right? You usually have to set their volume dials individually. You usually have to set their phase knobs individually if you have no automated system to do that for you. Sub EQHT automates that part of it, right? It automates the setting the volumes independently and setting the distance setting, which is essentially the same as setting the phase knobs independently. It does that automatically and then EQs it for you. So it's a little bit more automated, but it's not something that you're unable to do in its absence. You can still do it manually with the knobs on the back of your subs. Now, the issue there though, is that he's got Dayton subs, which do not have fully variable phase knobs. Mm. So that could be where it would be worth the expense of getting the AV receiver that has sub EQHT because you don't have the ability to set the, uh, the phase independently. You just have a polarity switch on those subs. Right. So yeah, that, that would be the thing. <laughs> and, and since we're talking accessories for less, we're talking like a $500 price point now for say the X3400H, which does have sub EQHT and gives you the ability to have independent distances set for those. So what's two the size. difference in price of the receivers though? I mean, what's the, what's well, the cause we, it, like if you went down to say an X1400, that's like $250. So we're talking doubling the price of the AV receiver the here. You're going to have to make that call. I yeah. mean, honestly. If you had subs that had fully variable phase knobs, I would say not worth doing this. But in the absence of fully variable phase knobs, where all you have is a 0 180 polarity switch, uh, it'd be nice to have that independent distance. Because, I mean, small room, and he cares about getting this uniformity throughout the room. That's the goal. So, well, as long as he places them across the room from each other. Yeah, you know, it should. Shouldn't make that much of a difference, uh, yeah. the, the phase knob. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, 20 feet difference between him and And we're not talking sub. them both on the same side of the room. Right. I I, I I, am not worried about that phase knob. Yeah? I don't think that he was... I, I bet he doesn't. He wouldn't touch it 
if he had it. <laughs> <I'll> be honest. <laughs> I bet. I, I bet that's the case. Uh, okay. We probably. I, I. I think I could. I could. Well, we're, but, we're given the arguments for. I mean, he said, "What would he be losing?" That. That's the thing you're losing. There you go. That's it. So if he gets the second sub of the new receiver, that will eat up all of his budget. But should he take that budget and upgrade his speakers instead? He's using RBH Impression R5BI speakers of the first generation right now. He was thinking of maybe upgrading to the NHTC series. So what will provide the bigger upgrade? Second sub, a new receiver or new speakers? Uh, the second sub <laughs> receiver, I think. I mean, as far as what the... you're describing as being a problem in your room, the only yeah. solution is the second sub. <laughs> right, I 100%. I mean... Y- you will, uh, first of all, if you were saying that you were going from, you know, some trash speakers to RBH, right. I'd be like, okay, well, sure. you've got a point here. But you're going from RBH, which are great speakers, mm-hmm. to NHTs, which are also very good speakers. Yes. So I don't think sonically you're going to notice a huge difference there, yeah. but you are going to notice a huge difference in getting that second sub and how uniform your bass is when you get your receiver yeah. as well. Like I would say like RBH impression series to nhtc series which is their flagship series i'm not going to say that's not an upgrade that that would be an upgrade right but you're starting from really good to like great versus i have a problem with my base that only two subwoofers can solve (laughs) so to me that's the decision so we didn't talk about the difference in the subwoofers. Let's get the sub twelve hundred oh, right. and the sub one thousand. So the sub one thousand, I don't know what the what the difference in the 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 performance. Right. Is. So the twelve hundred goes down to about twenty five hertz. The one thousand goes to about thirty thirty two hertz. So what basically you end up losing when you have two subwoofers that don't have the same performance is any anything that one subwoofer can do that the other one can't. You go back to having a single sub. Again. Right. So if your so if that, your major problem is right at twenty five hertz, if that's the worst offender, um, then this might not be a full solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So th- that's that's what ends up happening. You know, that's why we don't say that you have to match subs. Like I don't care what sub you get that plays down to twenty five hertz, right. as long as it plays fairly lin- you know fairly linearly down to twenty five hertz. It just matters that it goes down to twenty five hertz is where your first sub is at. Mm-hmm. When you get a sub that doesn't have the same performance or roll even if it was better perform- if you said, Oh, I'm gonna get an SVS, you know, P B sixteen or something like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'd Who be needs like, a bed? Well, just put a mattress on top of a yeah. sub. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I first of all where you're gonna put it, but second I'd be saying the same thing, but in the opposite direction. You're going to get this right. new bigger sub, which is going to play so much lower than your first sub. Now, everything below 25 hertz is a single subwoofer again, and now you've introduced new problems to your room. So I hear what you're saying about the the you only have room for the sub yeah. 10, but if or sub 1000, but understand that you if your problems are between 32 and 25, mm. you're not going to solve them with right this but if your problem is 50 to 60 hertz then you have solved that problem so it could right. it could still be entirely worthwhile it, it depends a bit on where are the offending frequencies sounds like you need to declutter buddy you need to <laughs> get enough room for that that other sub that 12 uh, sub 1200 brian brian is looking for a new projector he's enticed by the genuine 4k models at the five to six thousand dollar price point and likes the sony 295 ES and the JVC NX5, but we and others keep mentioning the JVC X790, which uses E shift instead of the Genuine 4K, but actually claims a higher contrast, deeper black levels, and of course costs less at under four grand these days. He's found several dealers near him in Indianapolis who have the Sony 4K projectors on display to see in person, but none of them had the new JVCs. He'd really like to see whether he this claimed difference in contrast and black levels is something he will notice with his own eyes. Mm. But if he isn't able to see a direct comparison in person, how, uh, can we help him make this decision? Uh, if, I can't. But <laughs> I, I first of all, I'm going to warn you against trying to see a difference in a setup. I mean, the, I mean, it depends on the dealer. It would setup. be yeah. the dealer setup would have to be very specific, and you know, seeing them side by side would be very hard to coordinate, uh, or see them at the same time. You know, it would be very hard to coordinate. And you'd have to make sure the rooms were as far as, you know, completely blacked out. Right. And the things were calibrated correctly and everything else. So. Which also applies to your room, though. Because that is true. Because the difference in that deepest, deepest black level stuff, if you've got a room that doesn't have 100% light control, it's not going to matter. Even yeah. if you have a room where you just have light-colored reflective walls, it's not going to matter very much. 
Um, right. You know, if, if but if you have completely full light control and you've darkened your walls and made them non-reflective and gone to all that, then it's going to be something that you very well might notice. I'm going to point you to AV Forums. That's the guys over in the UK. Right. Uh, it's not a full review yet, but it's like a first look review. Now they're reviewing uh, what would be here, the NX7 over there. They just call it the N7 for some reason, but it's the NX7. That's the model that's above the NX5 in the lineup, which means it has even higher claimed contrast than the NX5. Uh, but everything that they're saying in there, particularly when they're comparing it to the Sony's of comparable price and comparing it to the previous JVC's, like he's comparing it to an X750 or 7500 over there, uh, which is two model years before the X790, because there was a 770 in between. But all of the things that he's describing in there are really quite applicable to exactly what you're asking about. And I don't think I could really say it much better. The bottom line is, it's mostly about the lens <laughs> that he's most excited about in the new JVCs because it's an all glass lens that he's like, this thing is pin sharp. So on top of being genuine 4K resolution, which didn't make much difference, he's like, it has a better lens. So if anything, that's the thing he was most excited about, which I could totally get behind. It makes right, a big right. difference. Um, right. On the contrast front, he's like, yeah, it's a step down in contrast and black level from the all, all the way going back to the X750, uh, yeah, which even more so with the X790, but better than the Sony's uh, on that front. So I'm like, that kind of, if you can figure out where you want to land, I think that makes the decision. But honestly, having that much better lens, he's like, that's the most exciting thing. <laughs> So he's using the Onkyo TX NR787 receiver to power a 5.2.4 Atmos setup. He's using all RBH in wall and in ceiling speakers. He's 12 feet from his front speakers, and 8 to 10 feet from his surrounds and ceiling and in, uh, in ceiling speakers. He ran Accu EQ. That's Onkyo's a, thingy. Accu EQ. Onkyo's, yeah, Onkyo's room correction, which is I think room setup more than correction, and <laughs> seemed to nail all of his speaker distances. Dialogue is nice and clear when he has the volume turned, and when he has the volume turned up to intense levels, things all sound very good indeed, but at lower, more sane listening levels, <laughs> he's finding that he can barely hear his surround and ceiling speakers. Dialogue and his, uh, and his subs still sound good. If so, is there something he needs to change in the settings? Is this just a room acoustics, acoustics issue? Does his Onkyo lack amplifier power? What's the fix? Well, this is... This is the yeah. curves of equal loudness issue. What, yes. what is the what is the the um the the the, the charts that they use for uh the Fletcher Munson yeah, curves? That's it. Fletcher Munson Fletcher curves. Fletcher Munson curves. It just fell out of my head. I kept wanting to say Dunning Kruger curves, but that's how dumb people are. So uh <laughs> <laughs> which might also be <laughs> applicable in some cases. But but what's happening here is as you turn volume down, you have a harder time hearing certain frequencies. And, and that's just... directionality comes into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So what we when we run Odyssey, we have dynamic EQ. Mm -hmm. So we have dynamic volume and dynamic EQ. Dynamic volume, we turn off. All that does is make all the volumes about the same so yeah. that, you know, when a commercial comes on, it doesn't blow you out of your seat if you're trying to take a nap, which is the only time I ever used it. But worst but, of all, if there's a crescendo in the music, it doesn't actually crescendo. Everything yeah. stays at the same volume. So we're not fans of that. So the dynamic EQ, what it does is it applies these curves mm -hmm. so that as you lower the volume, it adjusts the volume of certain frequencies so that it becomes easier to hear yeah it keeps uh, things audible things that would have fallen below the threshold of all audibility because we don't hear all frequencies evenly and we don't hear all directions evenly uh they have these curves that that relate to that and when that happens it's like okay i need to boost these frequencies or boost these directions because we've lowered the overall volume to the point that it's fallen below the threshold of audibility it'll boost it back so what you've done is you've turned the volume down to the point where some of these frequencies are not as audible mm -hmm. to you and you're having this issue so mm -hmm. what's the solution well you kind of need to get another receiver <laughs> that will help but it's not necessarily i mean it depends on how low you've got it anyways i mean there's sometimes you just you know you just won't notice it because it's just pretty low there's that yeah so having it up at in intense levels maybe you're close to reference volume and the idea of reference volume is if you're listening at that you're hearing all of the frequencies and all of the directions 
exactly as the sound mixer and the sound mastering engineer heard it, that's the levels that they needed to have it to have everything sound the way they wanted to sound, to have everything audible. You turn the volume down below that, and yeah, you start to lose some sounds because our hearing is non-linear and not even in direction. So yeah, Odyssey has dynamic EQ to take care of that. Yamaha, they have y Pow volume, which does the same thing that uses those... Uh, curves of equal loudness to keep things audible. In Onkyo's case, they relied on THX because it is THX certified, the 787, it has the THX listening modes, and they rely on THX loudness plus, which is a very similar idea. You turn down the master volume dial, but it keeps all the sounds audible by using curves of equal loudness. The problem in Onkyo's case is that you cannot use a THX listening mode for Atmos. Mm. You can use it for 5.1 or 7.1, but you can't use it for the overhead speakers. They don't have a THX listening mode that can be applied to an Atmos or a DTS-X soundtrack. So your in-ceiling speakers, there's no way to fix that. And if you switch to a THX listening mode so that you can keep your surrounds and surround back, or he doesn't have surround backs, but you can keep your surrounds uh, audible when you turn the volume dial down, it's you're never going to have the overheads playing anything. So... It's just a limitation of what's available in, in Onkyo's receivers since they're relying on THX to take care of this issue. Mm. Rob. Rob bought a pair of Plan uh, Plantronics Bax Beat Pro 2 headphones. They offer low latency Bluetooth and noise uh, active noise cancelling, which are features he wanted, and they sound pretty good. He also wants uh, uses them as a headset for gaming, and everyone tells them that he sounds far away using the built-in mic. He read reviews before buying, and they all praise the features and sound quality, which he agrees with. But he didn't find a specific review site that fo focused on uh, at all on the built-in mic quality. Do we know of a site that does? No. Uh, no. So neither of the ones I'm going to mention give, like, big p features to it, but they do talk about the built-in mics, which is Tom's Guide. Uh, which hey, is Tom. good good for a lot of PC stuff. I do like Tom's guide for uh, reviewing PC equipment. And uh, Artings, Ratings, we've mentioned them before. They do headphone reviews as well. Most of which I don't agree with their opinions <laughs> on the subjective <laughs> side. Uh, for wh Whoever's reviewing over there has uh, different preferences and, and perhaps even outright different hearing than I do. However, they do take objective measurements as well, though, including on the microphone, and they have a section on that. And they did point out with these specific models, the Backbeat Pro 2 from Plantronics, that the bike ain't so good on that. Uh, objectively, it's just not that great. It has a small frequency range, not a lot of gain, both of which would explain why you sound far away. So right. uh, not uh, saying anything in there that uh, is countering what you're describing, and at least they do have it mentioned uh, quite clearly in their review. So yeah, check out ratings uh, for, for headset reviews going forward. It's pronounced Ruttons. Sorry. <laughs> Bill is having a house. Bill. All right. I'm afraid to say his name first. Bill. Bill is having a house built from the ground up, but things did not go, uh, did not all go according to plan. He wound up firing his contractor and starting over from scratch with a new design. Woo. Well, okay. There you go. That is not according to plan. <laughs> it's definitely not according to plan. Lister's plan was to spend a lot of extra money. So there's a new theater room. It's going to be just under 15 by 20 with a tall ceiling. So he's looking at right around 3,600 cubic feet total, maybe a little less, but not more. It's a rectangle and enclosed. He, he was thinking of planning on one sub in the middle of the front wall and the second sub in the middle of the back wall. The old plans that got thrown out include a smaller theater room. So he had planned on... That's why I fired that dude <laughs> i'm sorry how big do you say the theater's gonna be get out nice so you plan on getting a dual SV, uh, sfs pb2000 subs would those still be sufficient in for this larger room he'd actually like to use one pb2000 and one pc2000 the phys prices and physical sizes are right but would he be under buying for the room size 3600 i think that'd be fine they, they are right. So 3,600 cubic feet. Uh, so we often refer to Audioholics's uh, Baseaholics room guide. In their room guide, they say between 3,000 and 5,000 feet. They call that a large room. 3,000 and 5,000 right. cubic feet. They call that a large room. The PB2000 and PC2000, which have identical output and extension, so no problem using one of each at all, if the right. physical form factors make more sense for you, uh, they are certified large, according to Audioholics's Baseaholics guide. Means. Now, personally, uh, just going by the CEA 2010 measurements, which are uh, SVS clearly lists, uh, would looking at those, if you were getting up to around 4,000 cubic feet, I'd start to go, 
maybe if you want to hit full reference volume, you know, maybe you're starting to at that point. But you're at 3,600 cubic feet max, maybe even a little bit less. These are ideal. These should yeah. be able to hit full reference volume. No problem. Tap. Tap asks, how do you figure out how much green glue you'll need? It's sold in 28-ounce tubes or in five-gallon buckets. What's easiest and most cost-effective? Um uh, usually the most cost effective is buying the buckets, I would imagine. I mean, but... it depends on how much you're doing, right? If you're doing a yeah, single yeah. wall, probably not. Right. But if right, you're doing right. an entire room, the five-gallon buckets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That would be most cost effective. So they, in on their own Green Glue Company website, in their FAQ, um, now they say they recommend two of the tubes, two of the 28-ounce tubes, per four-foot by eight-foot sheet of drywall. Uh, you will also find them saying that if you use up to three tubes per four foot by eight foot sheet, that can um, sort of give you a little bit better base isolation, like a little bit more, but never to use more than three tubes. So basically between two and three tubes per four foot by eight foot sheet. So call it two and a half, right? So you need to figure out the surface area that you're installing. Uh, so that's all the surfaces, including your ceiling. If you have any soffits or bulkheads, make sure you include those. But you, you do need to total up how much surface area you have. Then you're just going to divide that by, well, heck, divide it by 32 because that's a four foot by eight foot sheet. That tells you how mm -hmm. many sheets you're dealing with. And then multiply that by 2.5. That'll tell you how many 28 ounce tubes you would need. Now, of course, there's approximately five 28 ounce tubes in a five gallon bucket, right? Yeah. So you I could guess. you could divide the number of tubes by five to tell you how many five gallon buckets you need. <laughs> there you go. That's that's how you figure. It. But yeah, if you bring it back to between two and three tubes per four by eight uh, sheet of drywall, that'll that'll total it up. All right. Let's see if we can maybe pop one more out here. Hopefully, before I have to go. Bob in the Philippines. Bob's got an LG OLED and an Nvidia Shield. If he plays a backup of an Ultra HD Blu-ray using Plex on the Shield. Uh, the little HDR logo pops up on his LG, uh, indicating that it has automatically gone into HDR 10 mode. The, the same little logo appears if he watches something in HDR from Netflix on his Shield. But if he uses the YouTube app on the Shield, his LG OLED never says HDR. There's, there was an update for the Shield not long ago where they specifically mentioned that it's now the first external streaming box to support 5.1 audio from YouTube. But does it not really do HDR? Is it maybe just that the videos he's tried are mislabeled? That doesn't seem to be the case because if he uses the YouTube app that's built into his LG, the HDR logo pops up. And when he plays those same YouTube videos, uh, when he plays those same YouTube, and if he uses a built-in Netflix app on his OLED, it says Dolby Vision instead of HDR. So no Dolby Vision on the Shield, right? And an HD, an H, and YouTube HDR, what's up with that? Well, not, I mean, I don't actually know, but you know, <laughs> what usually is happening here is some things are supported by some apps support some things and some apps don't and even though it's the same content you know you can't get atmos from certain boxes but you can get it from other boxes it's just sort of unfortunately the way it is so the very the very clear answer is no dolby vision on the nvidia shield that's just that's it no dolby vision you'll never see dolby vision pop up in your tv when you're using your nvidia shield as your source okay so that one's clear right but the HDR. So, I mean, obviously the NVIDIA Shield can output HDR. It does it with Plex. It does it with Netflix. It does it with Voodoo. That, yeah. But YouTube, for whatever reason, and I didn't even notice this because I, I rarely ever watch YouTube on my television. So I don't use my NVIDIA Shield and its YouTube app. I didn't realize. I don't know what's going on, but yeah, you're right. It, the YouTube app on the NVIDIA Shield at the moment does not output HDR. Crazy. I don't know what's going on. If it's a YouTube video that has actual 5.1 audio, it will output that as 5.1 PCM. And that, that is real. It's not just a stereo signal. It's a 5.1 PCM signal that comes out of the NVIDIA Shield, but no HDR. So you said you have an LG OLED. The LG OLED will play YouTube videos in HDR and it will output Dolby Digital 5.1 if that's what was used. So <laughs> use the built-in YouTube app. In your LG OLED, that's the better way to watch YouTube in that scenario. I didn't even realize the NVIDIA Shield didn't do HDR with YouTube. I'm sure it'll get an update at some point. It's Android TV. Android's made by Google. Google owns YouTube. Really weird. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, that one surprised myself as well when I went to check it. All right, we're in the end because I got to go get my hair cut. So, oh, can uh, we not let's... do rubs? I no. really want to give him an answer. Oh, give him. I, I got to go. 
I gotta yeah, go. It takes us like 15. five minutes. To... I thought you said 11, 15. I know, but I, it takes us like... You look at... We're already wasting time. It's like five minutes well, to, force to get this thing it's off. It's a fast answer. I, I already scrolled. Hold on. I gotta All scroll right. back down. 15. Where is Rob Fifteen. Fifteen. We can do this. It's a fast answer. Rob M. I already got Rob. No, it was a different Rob. It's the new Rob, not me, Rob. (laughs) Rob M. When Rob and his wife travel, typically two or three times per year, he brings his iPad so they can watch something on the plane. But they cannot uh, pair two pairs of Bluetooth headphones at the same time. So he tried using the headphone splitter, but then the volume was quite a bit lower with both pairs of headphones plugged in. So it was too low. Yeah. So what does he need? A headphone amp of some sort? They definitely need something that can power two pairs of headphones at the same time. And it would be nice if it were Bluetooth. And smaller is better for a plane, of course. Suggestions. Go quick. Creative audio. Their sound blaster. Uh, now, what is the model here? It's the E5 is the current model. It has two headphone jacks. It does Bluetooth, including low latency Bluetooth, which is nice, so you won't get the lip sync issues when you're playing the videos. It has an eight hour battery life and it plays crazy loud, even if your headphones are hard to drive. So that's the one. It goes for 150 bucks. All right, we want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Chad, Neil, and Chris and Luke for going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation. Thank you, gentlemen. Chad, Neil, Chris, Luke, thank you very much for those PayPal donations. I also want to thank our 82 patrons over at Patreon.com. Yeah, Patreon.com slash Podcast. Automatic donation if you'd like to sign up. Thanks to our 82 patrons. Lastly, we'll thank Mark for talking us up to Accessories for Less. Yeah, Mark, thank you very much for talking us up to Accessories for Less. I will just mention we had two questions left on the list, left on the list, one of them from Infinite Gary and one of them from someone who did not sign their name on their email and their email address just said a thing. So BDM180, I'm not sure who you are, but you're on the list. He's a robot. Okay. If you want to get your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask you ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Mandry. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.